Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, could the Navy's proposed headquarters be a threat to San Diego's waterfront? And could San Diego's two daily newspapers soon be owned by one man, what the publishers are saying? And we'll show you what the Border Patrol is doing now to discourage illegal immigration. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. A federal judge is considering arguments over a major development post for the San Diego waterfront downtown. The Navy Broadway project would include new headquarters for the U.S. Pacific Fleet. A group called the Navy Broadway Coalition says it wants more public space in the project. In court today, the group also claimed a military headquarters in the middle of downtown is a threat to public safety. The Navy is not commenting until the case is decided. A published report in the San Diego Business Journal created a stir today. It reported the owner of the UT San Diego, Doug Manchester, bought the North County Times and the Riverside-based California newspapers. But... UT officials deny it. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson joins us from the newsroom to talk about the situation. So, Eric, is the North County Times being sold? Well, it's a fair question, and the answer really at this point is not clear. Now, when the San Diego Business Journal published their story on the web this morning, we began making phone calls. I talked to UT San Diego editor John Lynch, and he said emphatically that there is no deal in place to buy the North County Times. Now, a memo saying that that was circulated to UT staff earlier today. North County Times workers that KPBS talked to say they've heard nothing about a sale, and there was no comment from Lee Enterprises. That's the Iowa-based media company that owns the two newspapers. So, why the story? Well, a San Diego Business Journal editor says the story is solid. They didn't want to identify the source of the information, but the publication said that the information is good and they stand behind the story. They say the reason they didn't include a source is because the person wanted to protect their identity. There were also the publicly expressed uh, interest in the idea from UT owner Doug Manchester in the past. Papa Doug, as he likes to be called, expressed interest in buying the North County paper. He's owned the UT since December and he recently lost out in a bid to buy the Orange County Register. By the way, UT editor John Lynch denied there was a deal in place, but he did not comment on whether there was a deal being discussed or negotiated. Lynch said he would issue a press release if there was news to report. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson. A veteran Customs and Border Protection officer is accused of letting people into the U.S. with fake immigration papers. Prosecutors say his brother-in-law was one of them. Thomas Silva is being held without bail. The government says he is a flight risk. Calling it a matter of transparency, San Diego mayoral candidate Carl DeMaio released five years' worth of tax returns today. The documents show he made two and a half million dollars from the sale of two companies he started. He challenged rival Bob Filner to release his tax returns. A group of Filner supporters is challenging both candidates to avoid attack ads. They claim special interests are bankrolling commercials to attack Filner. They say the candidates should reject those ads from their campaigns and from political action committees. Candidates sometimes hide behind these independent expenditures, claiming they can't control what their supporters do. But the truth is, they can control it. A spokesman for DeMaio says Filner's supporters are doing their own nasty ads. California's attorney general was one of those who took the podium at the Democratic National Convention last week. Belva Davis of our media partner, KQED, brings us this conversation with Kamala Harris. President Obama stood with me and 48 other attorneys general in taking on the banks and winning $25 billion for struggling homeowners. That's leadership. That's what President Obama did. And that's why we need to give him another four years. 
in your spot on the stage at this convention, yes. you talked about the your mom, you yeah, talked about the home mortgage crisis, the $26 billion settlement. Yeah. Are, has any of that money really gotten to people yet? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, part of uh, our role in the national mortgage settlement was to obviously primary role was to, to advocate for the needs of California. And um, as a result, we were able to bring $18 billion back to California. I decided that in addition to what happened with the national settlement, which, is, which was one monitor for the entire country, I was going to appoint one for California because we are so big. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure that we get everything that we deserve to receive and that we bargain to receive. The homeowners need relief right now. So we don't want to wait later and say, I told you so they weren't going to perform. We wanted to monitor it on a daily basis to make sure that that relief is getting on the ground right okay, now. i got to bring you back to Charlotte. Okay. Okay. One of the big tender moments last night was mm -hmm. when there was a video about a senior woman that uh, fired the president up by introducing it's called All yes, Fired Up. Yes. Is this an All Fired Up group and can they do anything yeah. when they go home to change what some had seen yeah. as a dampening of enthusiasm? I was there in that arena last night, and I will tell you, Democrats are fired up and ready to go and ready to reelect Barack Obama President of the United States. It, it was, it's been an incredible convention. And you know, there are two audiences for the convention. There are the people in the hall who are primarily delegates, which means they're already active in the party and they've been selected by, by other members of the party to represent them. They're leaders. And there's the television audience, which is millions of people. Some undecided, others, you know, maybe needing a little bit of motivation. And I think that this convention provided that for both audiences. And, and people are very excited in the midst of understanding that the president, in, in our country, we're facing a lot of challenges, but he's the one to take us through and move us forward. Well, there are many themes, and they were played, and they were hammered mm -hmm. home to us. Number one, the state of women and women's health. That's right. Uh, that was a big theme. Many people spoke to it. That's right. Uh, do you think that there's a better understanding, and mm -hmm. does it help with the issue of uh, what has now become Obamacare? Let me tell you something. So I I'll give you just a real-life story. Mm -hmm. I go to my dentist office, the dental technician. Mm -hmm. She's cleaning my teeth, and she says, I, I have to tell you, I'm going to do everything I can to reelect this president, Barack Obama. She's never said anything political to me before. You know why? Because she's pregnant and she was trying to get an improved insurance coverage so she can get prenatal care by two insurance companies. She was denied. And I said, why? She said, because when she went for her improved care, they said, well, you have a pre-existing condition. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> True story. So I think people on the ground do know it, and women have been, experience, have been experiencing it for so long, and now they know they actually don't have to put up with that. Women, by the very nature of physiologically, don't have to be a pre-existing condition. They now know there's another way to do health care. And since it has hit the ground, parents know that now they've already put their 26-year-old or, or younger on their insurance policies. Uh, seniors know that that donut hole is now being covered and, and they can have access to the prescriptions they need at an affordable rate. I think people know. Okay, so we got to push ahead with, uh, with gay marriage. Okay. Uh, the first president to endorse that. That's uh, right, he did uh, the right uh, thing. A convention that we got repeated speakers. That's right. Uh, you think the message is out? Is that battle over with? That battle is over. Okay. The president, as he said, he has, um, he, he has evolved to a point that all people should evolve to of understanding that there is one group in our society right now that is legally discriminated against. And you know, as a, ch a child of parents who met in the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. I feel very strongly about that point. And I think we all do, and certainly you do, Belva, with your long history yeah. 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 of commitment to civil rights. We've got, we've got to, you know, let's, let's be true to the, to the principles of, of our Constitution, which say all people should be treated as equal. Finally, the role of government, yes. briefly, mm -hmm. you still feel that's valid. That the government oh yes, has and I think that's that that is the, the 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 really sad aspect of the conversation that the Republicans are trying to have in this race, which is to suggest that government is bad, and that there is no role for government. You know, remember the Marshall Plan. Remember, you know, you know, you don't have to go back very far, and you don't, and you can look very recently to know there is a very important and legitimate role for government that uplifts the lives of people in this country and um, and so I absolutely do believe in the nobility of public service and and the meaning and the necessity of having a government that can provide services 
particular for those in need. You gained a national reputation, mostly over the foreclosure issue. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about you and your future. I mean, did, were you enthused to want to stand there where Barack Obama was last night? Or were you settled just for running for governor? Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> Do that out there. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I love being Attorney General of California, and you know, and I and I'm halfway into my term. When I walk into my office in Sacramento, or walk into a meeting with the National Association of Attorneys General from around the country, I am so proud as a daughter of California to represent California on issues like what we should get in terms of the foreclosure crisis, on issues like what we're doing around technology and privacy, mm -hmm. on so many other issues. And, um, and so that's what I'm focused on. I, I truly believe you got to stay focused on what's in front of you. And, you know, if everything goes well, the next thing will come. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Velvet. The Border Patrol is trying to end the revolving door for illegal migrants crossing from Mexico. Now, they face a range of consequences, including jail time. The story from Raquel Maria Dillon of the Associated Press. When migrants reach the central processing facility in Tucson, they're dirty and exhausted. Most have been walking in the desert for days without enough food or water. Some were caught by the Border Patrol just hours ago and still smell of sweat and desperation. And we'll start by rolling them, all 10 fingerprints, and taking a photograph and entering biographical information into the computer database. We'll get information back from that with a criminal history, any prior immigration history. All day, every day, even in the brutal heat of Arizona's summer, they arrive by the bus load. Here, the Border Patrol tries to weed out criminals and discourage migrants from trying to cross again. They are taking each individual alien and they are paying attention to his particular set of circumstances, and they are going to find the best series of consequences that we believe will prevent him from wanting to come back to the U.S. Migrants used to be taken to the nearest border crossing, where they immediately tried their luck in the desert again. But now agents try to fit them into one of many programs meant to deter them from crossing into the U.S. illegally once more. These people will be bused hundreds of miles away to Texas for deportation. The point is to make it harder for them to reunite with the smugglers who charge them thousands of dollars to get across the desert. We're trying to put the smugglers out of business. So if we can take that alien out of their clutches and perhaps put them somewhere else, then it's going to make it harder for them to make money. Some migrants were even put on airplanes back to Mexico City until that program was halted this year because of the expense. Some migrants go to this immigration court. Repeat offenders go downtown in shackles to face jail time. The hearings are like cattle calls. 70 migrants per day here at the Tucson Federal Courthouse. They're read their rights, they plead guilty, and they're sentenced up to six months in jail, all within as little as half an hour. Magistrate Judge Bernardo Velasco says the migrants have public defenders, their constitutional rights are respected, and people who violate the law are being punished. But that doesn't necessarily mean hauling migrants to court is discouraging illegal immigration. There's no way of knowing if somebody heard that somebody got 50, 60, 75, 105 days, 180 days, whether that deterred somebody. You don't know. You may never know. Critics say immigration cases are taking up valuable time and resources that should be spent investigating corruption and white-collar crime, and that some punishments are too harsh. Apprehensions of illegal immigrants have plunged since 2006, at least in part to heighten border enforcement. But the Border Patrol hasn't yet released data to show whether tougher punishments are working. Don't be fooled by this nice green grass from monsoon season. This landscape is treacherous. One misstep, one sprained ankle, or running out of water, it could mean death for a migrant. In Nogales, Sonora, just a few miles south of the border, deported migrants who have nowhere to go end up here at the Juan Bosco shelter. They wait in the chapel and watch telenovelas, then eat a simple dinner of soup and tortillas. Each one is pondering his options, trying to decide whether to sneak across the border again or go home to their families. Renato Arellano was sentenced to two months in jail the last time he was caught crossing the border. This time he walked in the desert for three days, ran out of water, and then he and his friend got separated from the group and lost. When Arellano tells the story of his journey, it's not the jail time that sticks with him. It's stumbling across two dead bodies beside the trail. 
They looked young, he says, 18 or 19 years old, just like him. And there were maggots. For the migrants bedding down here tonight at the shelter, the possibility of dying in the desert is just one reason to go back home. Now they also have to think about jail time. Ariano says he's still deciding whether to risk the desert again. Raquel Maria Dillon reporting. The Department of Homeland Security says fewer immigrants are being arrested in California. Arrests by the Border Patrol have been dropping. They're down nearly 90% since 1992. Last year alone, the number of arrests fell by about 28,000. California's pension reform plan is getting positive feedback from a credit rating agency tonight. The plan reduces pension benefits for new state workers. Moody says it helps the state's credit outlook. Right now, Moody's gives California an A1 rating, the second lowest in the nation. A new report says Americans cut back on borrowing in July for the first time in nearly a year. The Federal Reserve says total consumer borrowing dropped by more than $3 billion dollars. And folks use their credit cards less. The Fed says consumer finances are improving with fewer mortgage defaults and less credit card debt. But the job market is still weak. <music> Heavy drinking isn't confined to alcoholics. A recent survey found nearly 20 percent of students in San Diego high schools have had at least five drinks at any one time. A new study from UC San Diego suggests there could be a biological origin to binge drinking. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg says the research is based on a series of brain scans. Researchers at UC San Diego have been scanning the brains of a group of young people for more than 10 years. 24-year-old Tim Little has been involved since the beginning. Actually, a friend of mine got me in the study. Uh, he came upon a flyer uh, at the corner by Del Taco in Claremont and said, um, hey, listen, they're doing uh, brain scans and brain imaging, and uh, you know, they pay us a couple hundred bucks. Do you want to check it out? And when we were kids, like 13 or something, so I was like, yeah, yeah, hop down in it. Once a year since he was 13, Little has gotten his brain scanned at UC San Diego. This room contains the MRI scanner. It's just like those you'll find in a hospital, except this one allows more refined, more detailed images. While their brains are being scanned, study participants are asked to solve puzzles, complete simple tasks, and answer questions. This study focused on 40 young people. Their brains were first scanned when they were 12 to 14 years old, prior to the onset of drinking. Researchers scanned them again three years later and found some surprising results when they looked back at the original scans. The kids who later were going to start drinking showed less brain activation in some frontal and parietal areas as they were doing the task. They did okay on the task, but this maybe shows that they weren't as fully uh, engaged in the task as the kids who were going to get through adolescence without starting to drink heavily. Tapert explains as kids go through adolescence, their brains generally become more efficient. In other words, their brains don't require as much neural energy to accomplish a given cognitive task. But she says for the kids who later started to drink heavily, their brains worked harder to accomplish the same task. Well, that there is some kind of something that we need to take note of about these activation patterns prior to the onset of substance use that might be linked to some kind of feature related to maybe self-control, propensity for intoxication, um, kind of other kind of risk-taking propensities. Dr. Mark Shuket has been studying alcoholism for more than 30 years. His research focuses on how genetics and environmental factors influence heavy drinking and other substance abuse. Shuket says Dr. Tapert's study suggests there may be patterns in adolescent brains that indicate the likelihood of future alcohol abuse. But he says that doesn't mean doctors could tell someone they're going to be an alcoholic by the time they're 25. But I can do, I think, and what people in our field can look forward to, is I can say to you, you are carrying an increased risk for diabetes or for alcoholism. And regarding that risk, it appears that it operates through this particular characteristic.
perhaps impulsivity related to some of the risk, perhaps low sensitivity to alcohol for others. And then I can say, considering the fact that you are carrying the risk related to that particular factor, I think I can work with you, if you're willing to, to try to help you diminish your risk. Researchers haven't told Tim Little whether his early brain scans showed any unusual patterns. As it turned out, he did drink when he was in high school, heavily at times. These days, Little says he'll have a beer every now and then. And if it turns out Little has a biological propensity for alcoholism? Shoot, you know, I'd have to make a whole lifestyle change. If that was, a, that was the case, I'd have to give it up. You know, I'd have to focus on being healthy, try to, you know, just try to, try to make the best of what cards I got dealt. You know, if that's the case, obviously changes have to be made. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg, a much larger study is underway to see how reliably certain brain patterns predict future substance abuse. A lot of Southern Californians are reporting something smelly in the air today, an odor like sulfur or rotten eggs. The South Coast Air Quality Management District put out an advisory about the smell. They think it comes from the Salton Sea. Last weekend, storms may have churned up some bacteria to create the stink. The 11th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, nearly 3,000 people killed in uh, 2001. The victims are being remembered with memorial services around San Diego tomorrow, starting at UC San Diego, and continuing on different campuses around the county throughout the morning as well as early afternoon. An all-day blood drive is also being held at the Hall of Champions at Balboa Park. In tonight's public square, U.S. Congressman Duncan Hunter announced draft legislation on Wednesday to punish states, including California, if they issue driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants. Comments from the KPBS website were mostly against the punishment and for the licenses. Ilk wrote, it merely ensures they will pass a driving test, making them safer drivers, more likely to be insured drivers, and will lower auto insurance premiums for the rest of us. While Steve B. asked this rhetorical question. I thought that the Republicans are for state rights and didn't like top-down solutions. You can join in this conversation or comment on any other KPBS news story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.